Hello, I'm Althea Talbot Howard and this is a teaching video on Pan. Pan, the first, perhaps the most famous of Britain's six metamorphoses after Ovid. A wonderful short piece, free, improvisatory and very beautiful. How best can we perform it? Best thing to do is to begin by reading the story and I'd like to do that for you now. This is from book one in Ovid's Metamorphoses. Then Mercury told this story. In the chill mountains of Arcadia there lived a nymph, the most famous of all the wood nymphs of Nonacris. The other nymphs called her Syrinx. Many a time she had eluded the pursuit of satyrs and of other spirits who haunt the shady woodlands or the fertile fields. She was a follower of the Ortygian goddess imitating her in her pastimes and in her virtue too. When she had her garments caught up out of the way for hunting, as Diana wears hers, she could easily have been mistaken for Leto's daughter, save that her bow was of horn, Diana's of gold. Even in spite of this, she used to be taken for the goddess. As she was returning from Mount Lysaeus, Pan caught sight of her. Pan who wears on his head a wreath of sharp-leaved pine, and he spoke these words. Mercury still had to tell what Pan said to the nymph, and how she, scorning his prayers, ran off through the pathless forest till she came to the still waters of Sandy Laden. When the river halted her flight, she prayed her sisters of the stream to transform her, and when Pan thought that he had at last caught hold of Syrinx, he found that instead of the nymph's body, he held a handful of marsh reeds. As he stood sighing, the wind blew through the reeds and produced a thin, plaintive sound. The god was enchanted by this new device and by the sweetness of the music. You and I shall always talk together so, he cried. Then he took reeds of unequal length and fastened them together with wax. These preserved the girl's name. This was the tale Mercury was about to tell, and so the book goes on. So there we have the story of Pan and Syrinx, as told by Ovid in his Metamorphoses. This story needs very much to inform your interpretation of this piece. Pan was in love with Syrinx. She was certainly not in love with him. Syrinx was a nymph, a semi-divine spirit, a maiden of the woods, trees, hills, rivers, streams. So a very much part of nature. And um, Pan was in love with her and she scorned him. She refused to be seduced by him. She was prepared to sacrifice her own life and be transformed into marsh reeds rather than submit to his embraces. Pan cut the reeds, he picked them up and he made a pipe out of them. And that is what this piece is expressing. And one of the ways that I like to think about this piece um, is to imagine myself playing some pan pipes and just, I wish I had some to demonstrate to you, but imagine the uh, straight line at the top and the curve at the bottom as the uh, pipes get longer because we know that pan cut them into uneven lengths. And I like to imagine pan just sitting there and starting to blow on his pipes. etc. Okay, so Pan is just making music and blowing in an experimental fashion on his pipes. You have got to try and convey that in your interpretation of this piece without it becoming completely rhythmically wayward. So it's not very easy to do that. Just looking at the performance directions, the first thing that we're told is it's without measure, senza misura, without measure or not in strict time. But there is a metronome marking of quaver is approximately 138 beats per minute. If you're not familiar with quavers, that's an eighth note, 138 beats per minute. As I mentioned in my Niobe teaching video, Britton gave these metronome markings after he actually published the work. So it's only the later editions of the work that carry the metronome marking. 
the original edition of 1952 did not. But as I explained in the other video, several people were performing the piece and Britain felt that interpretations were becoming too divergent and too wayward. So he gave some indications as to the kind of timings that he would like. And this is his suggestion, 138 beats per minute, quaver beats. So if you're building this piece from first principles, and what I mean is if you're actually approaching Pan for the first time, and that could be you if you're preparing for a grade seven exam, that's going to take place either this year if you're studying for the Trinity Guildhall grade 7 or next year for both Trinity Guildhall and the associated board. PAN is set in list C and you might be coming to PAN for the first time. If you're doing that then I would like to suggest obviously you'll be under the guidance of your own teacher but here's another suggestion that you might like to start off with a practice tempo of quaver equals 100 and I would suggest that anybody learning this piece for the first time or anyone coming back to it after a long period of not having played it and perhaps wanting a fresh perspective would start with this practice tempo, quaver eighth note equals 100 beats per minute and play each of the first five bars several times strictly in time. That will give you basically just enforce the general proportion of the beats one to another because obviously we have some quaver beats, we have some crotchet beats as regards to the pulse beat. So the pulse itself is fluctuating, which is partly why Britain said, not in strict time, sense of misura. Once you've actually got a sense of um, the proportions, particularly in the principal theme, ya -da -da, ya -da -da. whenever we've got that kind of music, once you've actually established how you want to be playing that, then, you can start to bring in the variation in the tempo and there are three ways in which you can bring freedom into your interpretation. The first one is to consider and to vary the length of the pauses at the end of each bar. The second is to consider and to vary the length of the commas between each bar. And the third is to lengthen and vary the proportion of the pulse beats within each bar. So that's to basically to bring rubato into each bar. Those are the three ways in which you will primarily bring freedom into your interpretation, aside from the instructions that you're already given by Britain for when he wants you to get faster. So just to go over those again, there is a length of the pauses at the end of each bar. How long do you want them to be? Are they all the same length? Or are they not all the same length? The length of the commas between each bar. Are all the breath marks the same? Are some shorter, are some longer? It's for you to decide. Finally, the proportion of the, the proportionality of each bar, of the pulse beats, the rubato within each bar. Those are the three elements of freedom in the interpretation. I think it's very important. Let's say that you've learnt the piece and you've got it under your fingers and you're coming up to a performance speed, um, basically at least 130 quaver beats per minute. When you get to the beginning of bar six, which is the bar of pianissimo A sharps, it is my opinion that that should be played strictly in time. I think it's important to do that. It's a new idea. So the staccato notes are coming in and it's six semiquavers or six sixteenth notes there. And I think it helps to anchor the piece if you can play those strictly in time. There's plenty of opportunity for moving on because in bar seven, you've got the same six notes again followed by three triplet semiquaver A sharps, but accelerando is written in brackets underneath. So already you need to start moving forward at that particular point. Bar eight, again, we've got four of these semiquaver A sharps. Play them strictly in time, because before you know it, a couple of beats later, Britain wants you to start getting faster and to be making a crescendo at the same time. So plenty of opportunity there. Rallentando at the end of bar nine. And then we've got the very end of bar nine, I'd just like to say something about that. There's a bit of a tradition now of playing those last three notes, that's the in the second octave, the A sharp and G sharp demi semiquavers or 30 second notes to the paused A sharp also in the second octave. You can play those with a standard fingering, which would be this if you're playing conservatoire, but there is also um, the opportunity to do a harmonic there 
So in order to play the first harmonic, which is the A sharp harmonic, we need to finger the low E flat using the left hand E flat and then lean on the second octave key. And if you have a fully automatic instrument, unfortunately you won't be able to do this harmonic or very many harmonics on yours. But if you've got a semi-automatic, like this one, then you will be able to do that. So that's the low E flat and leaning on the second octave key there. Then for the G sharp harmonic, we want to be fingering the low C sharp, which is the 12th below, and then adding to that the first octave key. Okay? And then having done that, we go back to the A sharp, which is using the second octave key and the low E flat fingering. So A sharp, G sharp, A sharp. So do get your oboe out now and give that a try. A sharp, G sharp, A sharp. So in bars 10 and 11, we have a reprise of the original theme, um, the A major theme. And then in bar 12, we have a big change in tempo. Lento ma subito accelerando, those are Britain's instructions, slowly but suddenly getting faster. And I would like to suggest one possible relationship between the tempi that you might like to consider. It's not set in stone. Britain didn't give any indication. He didn't say play it at this speed, and I'm not saying play it at this speed. But I'm saying that you could consider this. You can consider a relationship of dotted crotchet is equal to crotchet. So three quavers worth in the previous tempo of quaver equals 138 beats per minute become a crotchet of the next one. In bar 12, um, the fourth set of notes, we've got the F sharp, G sharp, F sharp, and the E. Of course, those are triplets. Yada da da. So don't be put off by that. He hasn't written a triplet under those three um, hemi demi semis there. No, demi semis. Okay, under those three demi semis, he has not written a, a, um, a triplet, but they are a triplet. Play them as a triplet. Yada da dum, ba da da dum. Okay, so off that goes. Be very careful when you get to the first bar of the last line, you've got that big fortissimo trill. Make sure the trill isn't too long. It should be just two crotchets in length. That's a minimum in length, a half note in length of the tempo that you reached at the end of the preceding bar. Okay, so just be careful. Sometimes there can be a temptation to play that for too long. So it should just be a minimum. Then we've got our six A sharps in the next bar, bar 14, which should be again in the set tempo or whatever it is that your basic tempo is. And then we've got the cadenza flourish in the penultimate bar, second last bar. You can decide how you want to play those demi semis going down to the D. Do you want to play them all strictly in time? Do you want to get faster? Do you want to get slower? It's up to you. It's Pan doing a massive flourish on his pipes. A big Lissando, basically. And you've got to decide how he played it. And then the other one. At the end, as quietly as possible, and just with that very short note. As regards technical aspects of this piece, I think um, that probably one of the most useful things to do would be a, the, basically a similar plan of, of attack to the, the one that I described in the Niobe video. Practice the scales that relate to this piece, A and D majors and their arpeggios. Also, why not tackle some furling studies in the same keys A and D major? And again, you may be thinking, why is Alfie talking about D major? It's clearly an A major. Actually, it's really in a Lydian mode of D major. So we've got D major, but with a G sharp. That's the way that the scale really operates. And we've got that low D just before the end. We've got D as our final note. So make sure that you're going, that you're really going well in A major and D major. I'll just show you this, this study book. That is this. This is Ferling Blase, 48 studies. And the ones that we're looking at would be numbers 21 and 22. Those are in A. And we've also got here numbers 13 and 14 in D. 
So that's Pam, and I wish you every success with it.